Hello and welcome to the Monday, August 5th, 2024 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Let's first start with a very quick sort of notice about Secure Boot. Secure Boot depends on firmware and essentially boot process being verified using certificates. Whenever certificates are in play, we do have expiration dates and we do have certificate authorities that we trust that also have their expiration date. We're coming up on the first time that the Secure Boot Certificate Authority does actually exist. Inspired. This certificate authority was created by Microsoft in 2011, first used in 2012 with Windows 8, and it's going to expire in 2026. Now, that's still a couple years away, but expect sometime next year. So in 2025, you may see the first firmware images that are actually signed using this new set of authority. What this means is that you need to keep your systems updated. Microsoft did release an update with the July update for Windows, but you have to apply it manually. So I guess by the end of the year or so, you probably should get this applied. If you don't apply it, it's not that your system will stop working. All firmware images that were assigned before the expiration date of this original set of authority will continue to work. It will just prevent you from applying additional updates. And he wrote a quick note about some of the XML spreadsheet verifier hashes that he has talked about before. Well, there are really sort of two versions. There are these actual larger verifier hashes for the OXML spreadsheets. And then for the more traditional XLS files in OLE format, you have these 16-bit hashes that, of course, easily collide, as Didier has written about. So one question that Didier followed up on is, What happens if you have a traditional XLS formatted spreadsheet and then save it in the new XLSX format, so the OXML format? Well, it turns out it just retains the 16-bit hash token from the OLE file and just adds it to the OXML file. So no new hashing happens here. No stronger algorithm is being used once you save it as the newer format. And Wolexity has a great blog post showing how an ISP was compromised and then that compromise was leveraged in order to push bad updates to customers. This sort of evil crate attack, as it's sometimes called, is often more described as something that requires the attacker having uh, access either to the system delivering the updates or, for example, to Wi-Fi links and such that are close to the victim. In this case, it was the actual ISP that users were connected to that was compromised that allowed the attacker then to spoof DNS responses, which in turn redirected requests for updates to the attacker server that then delivered malware. As an example, the Volexity blog shows how 5K player, a video player and download software was targeted here. Of course, there's not much a user really can do about insecure updates or even recognizing insecure updates can be a little bit tricky. The critical feature to look for here is that these updates are digitally signed and that the signature is actually correctly validated by the update process. Other good to have things are of course uh, some kind of TLS tunnel to download the updates from. This often really doesn't work that well uh, because in particular for larger companies, the update often comes from a CDN. So it comes from some kind of random system that a user may not necessarily recognize. And then in order to protect yourself from these DNS machine in the middle attacks, well, a DNSSEC of course would be a nice option here. 
There has been well a lot of talk about the use of memory safe languages like uh, Rust and the problem that people keep pointing out that there is so much code written in C, C++ that it's a very monumental task to actually translate it all into Rust. DARPA came up with a tool now that promises to offer some help. They call it Tractor which is an acronym for translating all C to Rust. And well, as the name kind of implies, it's a tool that will automate the conversion from C to Rust. Given that the languages are conceptually somewhat similar, uh, I can certainly see a tool like this uh, working. If anybody has used it, let me know how well it works. I don't really do any C these days, so uh, don't really have a chance to uh, run it against the code that I recently wrote in C. The tool also says that they're leveraging some of the large language models, of course, and uh, that's certainly a tool that's appropriate for this kind of uh, translation task. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks for listening. Sorry, I'm not in Vegas uh, this week. I know some of you are there. A couple have uh, asked if I can meet. Uh, sadly, not in Vegas. I'll be in Vegas uh, in September, but for uh, SANS events. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening and uh, talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.